Hello everybody, it's exactly 2.50 p.m. and that means it's my session now. Um, my name is uh, Peter Desaric. I have been around the Linux community um, since the early 2000s on and off, spent time on crash dump analysis and various other smaller things. And lately I have been working on this thing called Sandbox mode, this is a catchy name and it attracts some attention, thank you. Um, the, uh, like upfront, I know that sandbox is a loaded term and this thing has nothing to do with sandboxing like um, namespaces and, and containers, whatever. It's a completely new thing that I tried out to protect the kernel from itself. And this is original research uh, funded by Huawei Technologies. Thank you very much. Uh, I was, um, I was um, contracted as an external consultant. So I'm not here as a Huawei employee. I'm just, uh, but it was paid by Huawei. So yes, um, they deserve the credits. And let's go to the matter. Um, okay, so I'm saying sandbox mode is a new mode, like a new process mode. Uh, uh, until now we had user mode, kernel mode, and I'm proposing sandbox mode. Why? If you look at the project goals, um, it starts with the premise that all software contains bug. Like everything is buggy, it's just a matter of how much buggy it is. And the goal is to improve self-protection by reducing the attack surface. I'll get to that. I mean, the problem with kernel mode is if there is a memory safety bug, then the whole system might be compromised and usually is. And I also wanted, I had a second goal. Okay, if we, if we make a sandbox mode um, or if we reduce the attack surface, can we do that um, uh, so that we can run kernel workload um, without interference from less privileged entities. It means like if, if, if for example, if uh, your kernel runs with the lockdown LSM, then it means um, UID zero is not as privileged as the kernel. And that means if the, if, if the kernel is locked down, then user space or user mode is not an option. Okay. I'll start with a very high level overview. Um, excuse my drawings, I'm not an artist, uh, but it should illustrate the point. Uh, let me first explain where we stand today. Um, so the options if you want to run something um, as a kernel workload is, well, obviously run it in kernel mode. Uh, the problem with that is, okay, um, these barrels uh, are like gunpowder and um, if you allow something that is buggy into this storage and it contains a bug, well, um, you can imagine what, ha what, what, what happens. So that's generally not a good idea. And um, although the Linux kernel is doing that, um, with a growing code base, might not be sustainable. And sometimes it's not even a good idea. Like sometimes you can't really completely audit uh, the code that you need to run. So um, this is suboptimal, like this is the, the full attack surface. We have alternatives. Um, we could make an eBPF program. Um, that's better. Um, it has some limitations. I'm like, I'm showing here. Uh, the main thing is it's no longer really kernel mode. Uh, it's eBPF code that gets translated, like I'm 3D printed on my illustration. And this also has some uh, limitations, like the size of the 3D printer means uh, size of the eBPF program. And uh, most importantly, there's this verifier. We only can run it in the kernel because some code has verified that um, it is safe to run. And this verifier is quite complex. 
and it also limits what can and can't be run. Like eBPF itself is, is yeah, Turing complete, so it can run anything, uh, but the verifier will not anything run. So, okay, maybe it's good, but it has some limitations. Also, um, uh, currently eBPF programs are loaded from user, user space, uh, so that's not an option if you really can't afford to um, allow interference from less privileged entities. That could be fixed. Okay, so I'm just mentioning it. That's a limitation of the current implementation. The other, th the other points are uh, like inherent to the solution. Okay, so if we don't run an eBPF program, well, can't we use user mode? Really, like there's this user mode driver and um, this user mode driver is in its own space um, that is separate from kernel mode. Uh, there are some communication path and yeah, that way if there is a bug in the user mode driver, it does not have any adverse effects on the, on the rest of the kernel. Uh, well, there are some, okay, this does, did not work well. Um, so these are attacks on the UMD. Uh, the, the, the one of them is uh, ptrace, the other one is kill, so signals and so on. User mode driver is protected. Um, the, the communication path is also in danger, like uh, it's possible to uh, find a file descriptor through procfs, for example. It is also possible to like, um, change the scheduling priority of the user mode driver. And if there is anything in the kernel that needs to run before or after or whatever. And so these are attacks and most of them are like, um, uh, they are currently mitigated. It's just that user mode was not designed to run kernel workload. So there is fear if you rely on user mode being fully protected then that may not play well in the future because someone adds a new feature to the kernel like IOU ring and forget that, okay, we also have to make protections for UMD. So yeah, it kind of works, but may become a whack-a-mole game. So how do I, what, what do I suppose, uh, what do I suggest? Um, I'm, I'm proposing something that's called sandbox mode. So you can see, this is very much like the kernel mode, but there is a wall. Um, there is a wall between um, code that runs in the sandbox and the rest of the kernel, which means it's exactly as dangerous, but if the sandbox blows up, it, the, the rest of the kernel can continue. That's the basic idea. Um, now, you may ask, um, yeah, this is good, but if it is isolated, what can you do with a sandbox? <laughs> um, right, so this is, okay, sorry, this is contained damage. Um, right, right now I'm not protecting sensitivity. So um, kernel data is read only. So if, the, if, if, if sandbox mode needs something uh, from the kernel, it can simply dereference a pointer. Um, kernel code is mapped into the sandbox. Uh, might not be a good idea, I'll get to that, but uh, yeah, by default it is. And some things can be called directly, so if you don't have any, any dependencies on pages that are not writable from, from the sandbox, which are behind the wall, so, so to say, um, then yeah, you can just call it directly. Um, if you need to modify something that is behind the wall, well, that will fail. And for example, kmalloc will fail. That, that, that's a big limitation. Um, it is also possible to share some data with the sandbox, like there is this shared page on the top of the wall. So that's something that the kernel can write into and sandbox code can write into. If you do that, keep in mind that it, it is a potential, like it, it it, um, it is a hole in the isolation, so to say, um, which might be acceptable sometimes, 
might not be acceptable. Other times, we'll get to that. Um, the thing is, if um, writing fails, then um, it is possible to intercept this and depending on the isolation strength and policy, either fix it up or abort. So first I'll get to the isolation strength. Um, the way I designed it, uh, there is weak isolation and strong isolation. Uh, weak isolation really does not do much. It provides the APIs um, and it uses the guard pages that are implicitly uh, provided by VM alloc and copies data into the sandbox and out of the sandbox. So the thing is, if I go back to this slide, um, the sandbox starts with some data already. That, like these two barrels, and these were copied into the sandbox before it was started. And when the sandbox uh, terminates, you can, the, the kernel mode can copy out some data. So that's how it communicates. Um, yeah. Uh, weak isolation is, does not provide much. There is also strong isolation. That's the main goal. And that will switch to its own address space while, kernel, uh, while sandbox mode is uh, running. That requires changes in some arch dependent, uh, like in, in, in the interrupt handlers and um, in possibly other code to make sure that it works. That was rejected, by the way. So but at least I, I wrote that for the x86 architecture, and that was rejected by the um, architecture maintainers. Uh, we'll see if the idea has some merit. I may try with a different architecture. So let me just uh, quickly present how sandbox mode works internally, now that we know what it should achieve. Uh, I'll start with... Uh, slide, that's how, how process modes work today. We have user mode, we have kernel mode. Um, user mode can use um, syscall APIs, it is unprivileged. Um, the kernel mode is privileged and internally there are kernel APIs. These are not really well documented, at least some of them are not. Um, kernel APIs means function calls inside the kernel. Um, how does this change with sandbox mode? Uh, okay, so we still have this uh, user mode, kernel mode, but we also have the sandbox mode. The sandbox mode is isolated and it uses kernel APIs, which means theoretically you can have sandbox mode for each process in the system. It's like a new mode, that's why I'm saying that's a new mode. Um, the essential features, how does it, like, okay, how does, if sandbox mode is isolated, how does it differ from user mode? Because user mode is also isolated, can't uh, write into the kernel data. Um, the big difference is sandbox mode is nested inside kernel mode. So if you look at user mode, user mode will just uh, call into kernel and the kernel will lazily do as little as needed and return. Um, Sandbox mode is started from kernel mode. Um, externally, it looks like it is still executing in kernel mode. Like um, if, you, if you make a process listing or for profiling, tracing, whatever, it looks like kernel mode is just um, internally executing something else on the CPU. It can access kernel data. I, I said that kernel data can be accessed um, and it prevents buffer overflows but with byte granularity because we are copying in, copying out. So we are copying only as much as, as uh, the trusted kernel mode said the buffer size should be. Um, violations are detected with page granularity because it uses uh, page tables to achieve the isolation. Um, just to make, I'm listing the APIs just to give an idea how that, how that looks in code. Um, each such sandbox mode has an instance variable. Uh, you initialize that, then you define the input and output buffers uh, with SBM copy in, copy out, yeah, or copy in out if, you, if, if that's data that is copied in and then modified and then copied out. You can also share it with uh, map read only or map writable. So these are the shared pages. Um, 
and then you call the function, and then you clean up. So that is easy. Uh, to make a function callable uh, in sandbox mode, there's a macro which will just wrap around the, the target function. It will provide a call helper and a thumb function, which makes sure that the, the parameters are passed correctly. And you just then call it SBM call with, with the parameters. Um, this is an example um, that was posted on the mailing list, uh, which converted AA unpack, the up armor unpack function, to run in a sandbox. So you can see that um, it has this, um, it has some changes outside uh, the target function, but no changes were necessary to the AA unpack itself. You just call it with SBM call. That's the last line before the um, commentary. Like there's this SBM destroy at the very bottom, then there is a comment line, and, um, and then there's, a, there's this error equals SBM call. So um, I'm only changing how, how AA unpack is called. I'm not changing AA unpack itself. Um, we still have a bit of time, so I'll... Um, spend a bit more time on the strong isolation. So now you have a, an idea how that looks in source code. What happens on the CPU level, um, in a strongly isolated address space, uh, we are making most of the kernel address space non-writable. And only the, the buffers that are, that are dedicated to sandbox mode are writable. That's why it is, and, and this is subject to the contain damage that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and there is no user space. That, I, I think there was a misconception about this. Uh, how, okay, um, I, I'm not, um, if I run that like this, um, uh, then the protection against accessing user space is lost. And that's not true because user space is not even mapped in this address space. Um, now, that is good. Uh, what I had to take care of is interrupt handling. Um, so I'm, I'm making a difference between intercepted interrupts and not intercepted. So not intercepted is where sandbox mode only wants to run the interrupt handler but does not really care what it does, like external interrupts from devices and so on. So the thing is, when, a, when such an external interrupt comes in, um, the CPU must leave the sandbox and run the interrupt handler in kernel mode because obviously uh, the interrupt handler was not designed to run in this sandbox. And then switch back. That's easy. And then we also have these intercepted uh, interrupts. Uh, these are processor faults and these may have to be handled. Uh, so they start the same, they enter kernel mode, and if, then they check policy if this kind of fault is expected. And in that case, it will fix up, fix up the, um, uh, the fault. But if it's unexpected, it will abort. So what I mean with a fix up, what is a fix up? Um, okay, since, it is, since sandbox mode is isolated and not privileged, uh, it runs with CPL3 in my implementation. That's not a prerequisite, but it has some merits. Um, I can get to that if people are interested. But because of that, it can't uh, do a lot of things that kernel code normally does. Um, for example, it can't allocate uh, dynamic memory. But this code is expected to contain calls to such a privileged code, like kmalloc. And the thing is, if this code does call kmalloc, for example, then this is, and the policy says, well, yes, um, we want the sandbox to allocate dynamic memory, then the, the, the interrupt handler will switch to kernel mode and see, okay, uh, we, we, we are expecting this kind of fault, and we can allocate this memory on behalf of the sandbox. So in some way, this is um, related to eBPF helpers, but it's different because like eBPF helpers, that's the, 
that's, uh, um, that's what eBPF programs have instead of syscalls, kind of. Yeah? Uh, here, uh, we are trying to run native kernel code, which contains like a call instruction, like a real CPU call instruction. And we'll just um, execute whatever is needed. I also call it a fix up because it does not just call kmalloc. It, it, also makes it also makes sure that the newly allocated memory is mapped into the sandbox. So sandbox can use it now. It may also check that it is a sane, um, like it, it may do parameter sanitization that would probably be needed for k-free so that if there is a bug, you can't free a buffer that was not allocated in the sandbox. Uh, all this is theoretical that has not been implemented. Like, but the idea is, yes, a fix-up should do some sort of sanitization. And the sanitization might be actually shared with these eBPF helpers, possibly. Okay. So that's it. Um, uh, essentially, I think this is the main core idea behind sandbox mode. And I want to give you some time for questions. So how expensive is the setup and teardown of the sandboxes? How they how expensive? Like okay. the setting up the memory mapping, everything, how expensive is it to yeah. set one up and tear um, it down? So setting it up uh, may not be that expensive. Obviously, we have to allocate all the page table hierarchies. Um, uh, entering and exiting the sandbox is kind of like, uh, it can be expensive because obviously you have to make sure that, um, um, that uh, the new mappings become active. Uh, Luckily, and, and that's why I said I, ran, I run it with CPL3 on x86, uh, because that allows lazy TLB invalidation. You know, like, um, but obviously, it, it's not the full story. If there is any user space, well, the user space uh, translations in the TLB are flushed when you throw the, the, the sandbox. Right. So that is expensive. What use cases you had in mind when you wrote this code? Okay, um, so um, the trigger probably is not the main use case I had in mind. Uh, okay, Th there are a few. So first is um, if you have to run a binary only module for any reason and you don't want to trust it, maybe you want to run it in a kind of sandbox. Um, and I know that binary-only modules are evil and you should not be using them, but still there are people who, does, who have to use them. Um, and second is, uh, well, for, for things that do not run on process context, uh, this TLB flush is not so expensive because we are only flushing a few pages that are actually used by the sandbox. And so things that... Um, that make a complex thing like uh, parsing user supplied data that might be crafted to trigger a bug uh, could easily run in, in sandbox mode. So this does not happen too often, like um, unpacking the up armor profile while you only, usually you only do that once. Yeah, so um, things like that, uh, parsing of user supplied data. So uh, you're trying to act as a safety net between yeah. untrusted user mode and... That's it. Make okay. it harder to exploit a bu an existing bug. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, nice talk. Uh, so, so can this be implemented for ARM64 as well? Um, and we use the same uh, levels like EL2, EL3? Yes, it can be implemented for any architecture that has paging, so anything that has an MMU. I haven't really uh, implemented an ARM64 version, uh, but I had some, okay, so that's in the 
um, in the backup slides. So if, if, if you had a sandbox mode on ARM64, you would run it at EL0, um, because otherwise EL1, if, if you ran it as EL1, you would have access to privileged registers, so you, you could escape the sandbox. Um, and the idea was like load a new value into TTBR uh, one EL one and like when starting the sandbox, and then at interrupt entry and exit, like implement something like KPTI uh, for the sandbox. Uh, there are some yeah okay I had I wrote down a note about uh, config on map kernel at EL one yeah yeah that's the KPTI for ARM. Um, there are some TLB considerations again, like uh, we would have to allocate an ACID uh, for each sandbox instance. Um, and yeah, global entries. Yeah, we can also implement the lazy TLB flushing here. And there is also, yeah, it, it needs its own uh, interrupt stack. It also needs it on x86. I skipped it for this presentation because that's an implementation detail. Uh, you can read it in the submitted patch series, but we would need something like that. There was a, there was a um, trick on x86 uh, to recognize um, user mode from sandbox mode, which used the saved CS registers. We, we don't have that on ARM, so we would probably uh, use a per CPU variable, but essentially it can be done. But this sounds a bit more expensive in terms of CPUs. I mean. Imagine going from user space and then in coming to the kernel space, you do the context switching. And then from kernel space, you have to go to the user, uh, the SBM mode, uh, more context switching. So have you done any profiling? Uh, and then like, is there any, uh, po like what's the possible Im impact in performance? Uh? I definitely didn't do any profiling on ARM <laughs> because I didn't even write the code. I just made a sketch uh, how that code should look like. Uh, on x86, I didn't, um, uh, or like, okay, um, loading an, uh, on, 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 on x86, loading a new value into CR3 is a relatively expensive operation, uh, but uh, yeah, like uh, it, it's manageable. Um, on, a, on a three gigahertz CPU, the latency added by like entering and exiting the uh, the sandbox mode was under one millisecond, which is like, um, yeah, still a lot. Like if you're talking about nanosecond latencies, then this would, this was noticeable. Um, would divide that by two, but you know, like, yeah, was on the, on, on the order of it, like hundreds of nanoseconds, uh, even if I optimize it. It's still expensive. I mean, yes. You would usually go from user space to kernel for like you know memory allocations and uh, and on those things, and there'll be frequent calls to the kernel, and then you're switching again to the SBM mode. I think it will be more frequent. Uh, it's going to be more expensive. Right. That's why I'm, I'm saying my target was things that do not run frequently. I wonder if if the if if the performance hit could be justified for some use scenarios. Um, it, it depends a lot on, on yeah, like I said, it, it, it depends a lot on, uh, on some factors um, that are unknown. Like, um, is there a user space that needs to be repopulated into the TLB, for example? Exactly. Uh, but just, in that case, it's prohibitively expensive, but if there is no user space, then it might work. Okay, All right, thanks. You're welcome. The kernel text has com commands in it that require CPL zero. So what does failure look like? I mean, you're gonna get general protection faults and it, does it blame the sandbox and make it easy? Okay, so um, depending on what you want to have. Uh, so generally, yes, if, if, it, uh, if it raises a general protection fault, it will abort the sandbox and return an E fault to the caller. Um, but if you so wish, you can write a fix up for the general protection fault. Like you, you may allow to disable interrupts, for example. But keep in mind, well, then the, then the sandbox is allowed to, DDoS, to, to DOS the, the CPU that it's running on. <laughs> Do 
Okay. Any other questions? Then thank you. Um,